Since creation, humans were never meant to be alone. And since creation, there has always been the temptation to withdraw. Loneliness seems safer and easier. But community is what brings us life and strength and fills our life with meaning. Our community picks us up when we fall and carries us when we get weak. Our community helps us shoulder our burdens when they get too heavy. We need people speaking life into us and growing alongside us. Our life was never truly meant to be done alone. God wants us to be in community and the enemy wants us isolated. Because when we gather, change happens. When we're together, all of hell waits. We do far more for the kingdom of God when we come together. And while isolation seems tempting and easy, isolation will bring inevitable discouragement. So we must fight the ever persistent temptation to pull away and rather to unite together. Just remember, you don't have to do it alone. You weren't created to. Yeah, community. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you and I. That was uh, part of Pastor Pete's last gift to us, was the title, you and I in community. So only his creative mind could have done that. Definitely not me, but... We're grateful for you. Anybody uh, like baseball? How about, how about some of you old timers? You hear of a guy, a catcher by the name of Yogi Berra. Anybody? Now, I was a catcher in high school, so I know about Yogi Berra. In the World Series, they were playing the Milwaukee Braves because back then, you know, they switch around. And uh, Hank Aaron was up to bat. Now, a good catcher will talk a lot of trash. Did you know that? part of their job. They're going to be talking trash while the batter is up, trying to get into their head. You know what I'm saying? A good catcher knows how to get into the heads of the batters. And Hank Aaron stood there, and of course, Hank Aaron was the power hitter uh, for the Milwaukee Braves. And this was the World Series, so the world was watching, and Hank was trying to distract, uh, uh, excuse me, Yogi was trying to distract Hank and he said this to him, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to hold it so that you can read the trademark. Aaron didn't say anything, but when the next pitch came, he hit it into the left field bleachers. And after rounding the bases and tagging up at home plate, Aaron looked at Yogi Berra and said, I didn't come here to read. What are we here for? Do you know what we're here for? Do I know what we're here for? You know, Pastor Brad mentioned that we're here for worship because ultimately we're called to worship God for the rest of eternity. So we know that that's a part of why we're here. But do you know why we're here still on earth? John Piper, famous theologian and pastor, said, missions exists because worship doesn't. Do you know why we're here on earth? Do you know why God's given you your career? Do you know why God's given you your marriage? Do you know why God has given you those three blessings? Hold kids. <laughs> Do we know why we're here in church? I've heard it said that if we aim at nothing, we'll be successful 100% of the time, but who wants that kind of success? You know, a pastoral transition is happening here at Mesa Church, and sometimes that leads to people leaning out. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm leaning in. Because what God is doing in this church is not dependent on who is leading the church, human-wise. It's dependent on who is leading the church. 
You know, last week we had eight water baptisms, seven on Sunday morning, one on Monday afternoon at Pirate's Cove. We ran out of parking. We had an attendance record, non-Easter, non-Christmas attendance record. That happened last Sunday, the Sunday after I announced that I was transitioning. Can you say, praise the Lord? (laughs) It's because it's not about the lead pastor, it's about the lead pastor. (laughs) Jesus, we're leaning in. And I know that sometimes we have a lot of baggage because of previous transitions and what is God doing. And I want you to repeat after me this is not that. This church has strong leadership that knows who the lead pastor is. Strong leadership that knows who the lead pastor is. (laughs) It's Jesus. And so we're doing a series, this is, this is, I just felt like Jesus say, focus on what will be sustained in this next year and beyond, even when you're not here to preach it. And so we're preaching on community, because that is one of the things that I believe that God's called the church deeper into, and what this church in particular does so well, does it amazingly well. And so I want to welcome you to Mesa Church. My name is Jordan Hansen, and for the next few weeks, I will ha- still have the privilege of being the lead pastor here, and I am excited to be delivering some of what I believe to be the most important messages for the church today, and it's connected to the name that God gave you, Mesa Church. I, I didn't give you that name. The Lord gave you that name. Secretly, you already had that name. That's the funny thing about it. Um, and so we're just so excited about the Uh, series that we're in. Last week we talked about leaning into comfort, and this week we're going to talk about leaning into mission. But what you need to know is the previous five-week series was actually the first sermon series on in this new year on what this community looks like, and that was a five-week series on what it means to be a spirit-led community. Okay, it's a huge, huge part, a huge part of the foundation of this particular series. You need to understand the Holy Spirit is a part of these five messages in every single way. And so uh, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, 16 through 20. As we ask the question, what are we here for? I'm just going to answer it for you. We are here to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Mission exists because worship doesn't. You won't be able to evangelize people in heaven. Did you know that? (laughs) There will be no mission. They'll just be worship. It's going to be amazing and awesome, but the difference between here and there is there are people who do not know Jesus and who don't worship him with their lives. There are people in California, right now in Southern California, in Orange County, that need Jesus. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And that mission remains the same because Jesus is still the lead pastor of this church and he cares about those who are not here. He loves those who are not here. And when people come into this community, they feel that love, that love that we have for God and that love that, more importantly, that he has for us. That's what we're going to be looking at today, leaning into mission. So we're here to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And and in his last words on earth, he co-missions us despite our doubts, our fears, our anxieties, our issues, our weaknesses, Our addictions doesn't matter to him. Jesus knows exactly who you are and what you bring to the table. And he likes it. He likes it enough to choose you. Because he loves you so much. And he gives us this mission. And, by the way, he promises us that he would not leave us, that he would be with us. So why was Jesus so clear? Well, if you live in Orange County like I do, you know that there is a lot of distractions, aren't there? And without a clear mission, he knew that we would drift away from what matters most in life. And at Mesa Church, our name is a practical way to understand our mission. And when we set the table for others, we get to make the ultimate difference in their lives. So I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. I actually have preached on this before. It's gonna, I'm going to change it up on you, but this is one of those capstone passages in all of the New Testament, I believe that it, it, you have to read through the whole Bible through what Jesus says. These are his last words. Would you pay attention to someone who, who has some things to say to you and then he's about to leave? These are Jesus' very last words on earth. This is what it says. So Jesus is about to leave 
And his last words are extremely important. This is what Matthew 28, 16 through 20 says. Then the 11 disciples, why? Because Judas was no longer with them. He had betrayed Jesus and committed suicide, so he was no longer amongst the 12. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. By the way, if what I just brought up to you disturbs you a little, just know that Jesus reinstated Peter, and I believe that Jesus is gracious and loving but you've got, I spoke on this a couple years ago on Easter. There's a, you have to be open to the restoration that Jesus wants to do in you. So it doesn't really matter what kind of betrayal or sin you've had. Come back to Jesus. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. So Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Turn to your neighbor and say, go. 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 And make disciples of all nations. I wish he would have said, make disciples of your neighbors. And left off the nations. That's a big mission. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you and be sure of this. Be sure of this. I am with you always even to the end of the age. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you that you are good, that you have a plan for the church, a purpose for the church. You have a plan and a purpose for each of us. We have callings. You have called something inside of us to come out of us, Lord, that on earth there is a plan and a purpose for our lives to be involved in your mission. God, I think of the many people in your lifetime whose lives were touched because you got out of your neighborhood. You got out of your head. You got out of your circle of friends. And you went to where the people were. Lord, outside of Jewish territory, to places where Jews wouldn't even go, like cemeteries. And you healed people, you delivered people, and you preached the kingdom of God. And it was close because you were close. And it's close to us because you are close to us. We feel your very presence today. So I pray that you would remind us of what our mission is. It's in your name we pray, amen. Friends, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Did you know that that is how we say it at Mesa Church? You can say it however you want. It's okay. Every church says it a little bit different, and that's okay. Jesus said it like this. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching these new disciples to obey the commands that I have given you discipleship is a bible word a church word that means a growing relationship with him it means an apprentice type relationship with the master teacher who's not just a teacher but also a prophet and lord god himself in the flesh and so this is how we say it our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with jesus that's our definition for discipleship and everything we do under that umbrella has to be filtered through that mission our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with who? With Jesus. What kind of relationship? A growing. It's not a stagnant relationship. It's not a once and done sort of thing. It is a dynamic reality that changes the course of our lives. It changes everything about who we are. In fact, the day that you pray the prayer, which I am all for, you're just beginning to understand just how big that prayer is and will become in your life. So Jesus has been hanging out with his disciples for about 40 days, and some are having these doubts. The first thing about the mission here that I want you to get, and I want you to get so clearly because sometimes people think, well, I have to be perfect to go to church, and I have to be even more perfect to do anything for God, and nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> In fact, if you think you have to be perfect, you're actually unqualified to do anything for God. Ready or not, you ready? Jesus has commissioned you. <laughs> Count yourself amongst the disciples. 
In fact, God will actually often use your imperfections and your weaknesses to show himself strong through your life. He'll, you're, he'll use your brokenness and your testimony for you to stand up and say, I couldn't do it by myself, but because Jesus did it in me, I'm here. He's commissioned you. Your doubts about him, your doubts about yourself, they don't change his directive. He's commissioned you. I want you to take your hand, put it on your heart, and remind yourself, I am commissioned by Jesus. I am commissioned by Jesus, who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And this is what he's commissioned you to do, make disciples. The verb to make disciples is used four times in the New Testament. This is one of those times. It's one of the most strategic, important moments in Jesus' ministry because he's about to leave and he's telling his disciples, hey, if I have to summarize all that I want you to do, this is it. Take my ministry. Take my ministry and do what I have been doing. Um, there's one verb in those, those verses. And I know it seems like teaching is a verb, go is a verb, but none of them are. They are all participles. The verb is to make disciples, and going, baptizing, and teaching are all participles that modify the verb. It's not translated like that, though. So in English, you just think, well, those are all verbs. No, they're not. They're participles that modify, make disciples. Making disciples is the main verb in that whole verse. So Technically, it's not go make disciples. It's make disciples as you go. So as you're living your life, as you're doing your thing, as you're doing you, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them everything that I have taught you. What does it mean to be an apprentice of Jesus? That's what Jesus is telling his disciples to do with those that are becoming apprentices of Jesus, not of them. We teach them the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, what it looks like, what it feels like, spiritual disciplines in order to be close to Jesus, to be transformed by Jesus and the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Spirit like Jesus. And then finally, he gives us probably one of the most powerful promises in all of the New Testament. He says, as you do this, I, I want you to understand I am with you to the very end of the age. Now, the, the Luke-Acts equivalent of that is I'm sending my Spirit to be with you. And so God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is with us as we fulfill the mission he has called us to here on earth. Again, mission to make disciples exists here on earth because in heaven there will be no mission. So missions exist on here on earth because worship doesn't in the here and now. So the last time I checked, not every person on the face of the planet has heard about Jesus. A lot of missionaries will say it like this. Everyone is equally lost, but not everyone has an equal opportunity to hear the gospel. And we are blessed in the United States. And it's part of the responsibility of what God has placed on, I believe, every church in the United States to partner with missionaries who go to the least reach areas where the gospel has not been preached. So that the mission of Jesus can be extended to places where there is an unequal opportunity to hear the gospel. All of us are equally lost, but not all of us have an equal opportunity to hear the gospel and to choose Jesus. So Jesus has commissioned us, doubts and all, and promises to be with us. Why? Because Jesus knows that without a clear mission, we drift. You know what drift is? Distracted, drift. We're a community walking hand in hand in the same direction. Terry, would you come up to the front? A good marriage has to be intentional. I love my wife. She's amazing. But do you know that we have to be intentional with our marriage? See, we have to be intentional about investing in our marriage, but we also have to be walking in the same direction. 
You see, if Tara was walking to that corner and I was walking to that corner, and I've done this with Joe and Renee, I don't know if you guys remember, you walk that way, I'll walk this way. Eventually what happens is you just start to get to a place where you, you drift. And unfortunately, drift... Drift is very common without intentionality. So here's the thing with drift, and here's the thing with our mission. The mission never changes, but the methods do. I'm going to drop some stuff on you today. I just want you to know that this is all in the notes, but it's good for you to take notes because it, then it processes in a different part of your brain. So I'm just saying, this is some good stuff today, okay? This is, I normally don't say that, but I'm just telling you. The mission never changes, but the methods do, and a lot of people get this wrong. Let me share with you a couple organizations that drifted, okay? They got it switched. The mission changed for them. Harvard, mission statement. You ready for this? To be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of your life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. That's crazy. Yale, Dartmouth, Princeton, all founded in the same way. YMCA. By the way, I love YMCA. I am a member of the local YMCA, so I'm not trying to trash the YMCA, okay? Founded by George Williams to teach the Bible and organize prayer meetings with the poor youth in London. At one point, it was the largest missionary sending agency in the country. <laughs> Today, it's a gym. By the way, it's a great gym. I like it. I'm not against it. Um, they do a lot of good things for the community, but I never hear someone ask me if they want to pray for me or anything about Jesus. I do like the YMCA. Pawn shops. The pawn shop industry has roots in Catholic friars who wanted to help poor families in their communities. And now the industry oftentimes exploits this very sector of society. I want you to know, I have nothing against a good thrift shop. My wife would probably kill me. <laughs> Sometimes they're really helpful and still beneficial. I know the, the Salvation Army still sort of leverages thrift shops to help and raise funds. So again, I'm not criticizing. I'm just pointing out drift. It doesn't happen quickly. It happens over decades and even centuries. The Pew Trust and, and the, the, the friend of Billy Graham, Howard Pugh, who earned a lot of money in the family oil business, Sunoco, co-founded Christianity Today and Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Now the Pew Trust gives to the Ivy League schools that he criticized and Planned Parenthood, the largest organizational, organization of giving uh, abortions today. Drift. Drift, drift, drift. Let me repeat what I know about the mission, a very clear mission prevents drift, but without a clear mission, there is drift. The mission never changes, but the methods do. It's very important for us to understand this because in a time of transition, the community needs to lean into the mission of Jesus so that there's not drift. By the way, God has a calling on your life, Mesa, to be a light in California. His calling on you has not changed. It's only going to get intensified. These are methods that can change. Buildings, they change. They're methods. They're tools. They're, they're things that come and they're things that go, but they don't change the, mis, the method of building. Instruments. Did you know that the organ, once upon a time, was viewed as the devil's instrument because the organ was used in emperor worship when it was first introduced? which we don't even have an organ, but I'm just telling you, isn't that odd? I always thought that the organ was the most sacred of all instruments. <laughs> Apparently, it's the most devilish of all instruments, historically speaking, you know. But instruments, sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't. Have you noticed you can sing a cappella? It could be a holy moment. There's no instruments happening. What? It's because it's a method. It's a part of something that can change, may not. That's a method, Small groups or Sunday school, it doesn't matter. Just get together. <laughs> Who cares about the time? Clothes, robes, choirs, no choirs. These are all connected to culture. Now, there are things that are 
substantive in culture and things that are superficial in culture. We're going to talk about that in a second. I want to give you an example of a group that understood that methods change, but mission doesn't, Young Life. How many of you know about Young Life? It's an evangelistic organization that works with a lot of young people. And did you know that when Young Life first started, they reached high school students through evangelistic barbershop quartets? Now, that would work with Ken Stacconner. I already know that, but he's like a, you know, one, one in a million or whatever. Um, with the rest of the high school students, they may not be super motivated by a barbershop quartet. Although, hey, I think they're, they might make a comeback. You know, have you noticed that? Culture sort of recycles, people are wearing bell bottoms, and then all of a sudden it's, it's a thing again. So I don't know, maybe barbershop quartets is so old it's new. It'd be kind of fun. But the reality is it's, it's simply... It's a method. And so that's why, that's why we have to marry the mission and what matters. You date the methods. You don't hold the methods as sacred. This, this, this is really important. I want to I clarify something. So you, you're seeing this all across the nation. And, I, and I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just pointing out I'm observing something that I have noticed. Mainline Protestant denominations are changing substance and not the superficial, and they are shrinking. Pentecostal evangelicals and and anyone else who's willing to change superficial, not substance, they're changing the superficial, not substance, and they are growing. Let me tell you what you don't want to change, doctrine. Denominations are changing doctrine, and guess what's happening? God is not blessing it. He's not breathing on it. People are not being saved. They're not hearing the gospel. And churches, whether Protestant or evangelical, when they stick to what Jesus clearly spoke, labels don't matter, by the way. A church can be this or a church can be that. It's what matters is what they hold on to, what they cling to, what they're married to. And we have done our best to date methods, but marry the mission and what matters because everything is subject to change, but not the mission, not Jesus, not doctrine, not what we know will actually see lives transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's about like changed lives. The gospel is, is a gospel of change. In the middle of a, of a world and a culture that's going crazy and it's chaos and it's full of sin, the mission of Jesus remains. It's consistent. Without a clear mission, we drift. And so we focus on that mission. It never changes, but we're open to the possibility that methods do change. I mean, we're sitting in a in a big auditorium with seats that detach from each other. I remember the days where I slept under a pew, and I thought that that was the only thing that you could have in a church building was a pew. And nobody's laughing, so I think maybe, I don't know what's going on in your heart right now, but (laughs) (laughs) it doesn't matter what your butt is on. What matters is what's going into your ears and into your head. What is the mission? What is the method? What is the... The message of Jesus, sorry, those, those methods, they can change. I love thinking about Jesus on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, and he's got thousands of people there. No pews. They're all sitting on the grass. Their butts are probably soiled from the dew the night before, you know? But they're hearing the words of Jesus. And the word of God. Everything's subject to change, but not the mission, not Jesus, not doctrine. So date the methods. Hold those things loosely. It's okay. I know, and, and now we're starting to pack up, and Tara's ready to get rid of everything in our house. And I'm like, no, 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 you can't get rid of that. I, that has sentimental value to me. Remember the message I told you, I don't like change. So I'm with, I understand this. It's just stuff that could preach. So why is Jesus giving us such a clear message? Because he doesn't want us to drift. 
So this is what we're going to do. We're going to lean into the mission. Like we talked about leaning into comfort last week. When we're mourning, this place needs to be a refuge where people can be comforted. Because life is uncomfortable. Jesus oftentimes sort of pushes us into uncomfortable places and positions to grow us and to grow others through us because of what we've learned in that season of trusting Jesus and knowing that he cares for us and loves us and and we're going to make it. But we also cannot become inbred, focused only on our needs. Because part of the healing process happens when we begin to take our eyes off of ourselves and see the need in other people's lives that God has gifted me to help. So we lean into mission. And we will lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And I want you to think about our name, Mesa Church. I love how Diana pronounces it, Mesa. It, technically, there's two ways to pronounce it, okay? Because it has an English definition, and it has a Spanish definition. The Spanish definition is table. table. Do you know what the English definition of, of mesa is? It's a flat-top mountain, which, by the way, both of those symbols are amazing in Scripture. <laughs> it's like God really hooked you up with a cool name. I'm just saying. Mesa is our mission. It's a really practical, easy way for you to think about what we do here and why it matters. And this week we're going to talk about organizationally what it looks like. Next week we're going to talk about what it looks like organically because I know some of you live in Costa Mesa and so the moment you hear the word organization, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm so freaking out right now. I need organic. So we're going to do that next week, but this week we're going to talk about organizationally. I love how organized God is. That's why Sharon and I have always gotten along so well. One of the greatest compliments I ever heard, someone came into the church and they were like, wow, everything is just so well organized. And I thought, yes. (laughs) Well, just think about the body, okay? I mean, God gave you a body and how organized your body is to get all of the stuff that your body needs to get done, which by the way, you don't think about any of it just happens naturally and organically. (laughs) But it's all organized. It all has a purpose, okay? So I want you to think about a table. It's not the legs of the table that matter. It's what happens at the table that matters. But these are the four legs of our table. And these are the four things that I want you to commit to in this pastoral transition, to lean into mission. This is going to be very practical. You've heard these things before. Number one, I will faithfully attend Sunday services to know God. Number two, I will join a small group to find freedom. Because we believe that freedom happens in accountable relationships where we will not be judged, but we will be prayed for and helped and loved through. We will attend the mixer and growth track to discover our purpose so that we can, fourth, serve on a dream team to make a difference. All of those things are the organizational things that we do as a gathered body to do what? Here's the vision. Keith, I want you to put that um, photo of the table up. Yes, praise the Lord. Food, you can say yes. This, This is what God's made us for. By the way, the next generation is so much more into this than the other pathways, you know. One of my favorite memories growing up, and track with me, I, trust me, I, I'm, I'm on my outline, but i kind of off my outline right now, was and is still holidays where the family comes together and everyone just gorges themselves, okay? <laughs> you got fasting and you got feasting. Both can be godly, all right? I'm just saying. The family comes together and they eat. And you know that feeling that you have when you have been fellowshipping with people that you love? You're not too fond of their politics, but you love them, okay? That's the family gathering. There's always that weird uncle that, you know, says too much or whatever. And you're just hanging out. You're watching football. Everyone is just kind of like, and it's it's that feeling of like, "This this is like what life is supposed to be about. That's what God wants for you. That's the kind of relationship He wants for you. That's what He wants the church to feel like. 
we're all connected in relationship with each other in Him. And, and the, the, the legs that we've talked about, they just set up the table for this meal to happen that Jesus is cooking for us. And He's hosting that dinner in such a way that our, the places in our heart just are filled with His love, where we share His love. And, and we see that happening, not just when we come to church, but we see that happening. There's something special when the family of God comes together. I, I'm telling you, your name is an apologetic for the next generation because they don't buy into the religious reasons that you used to buy into. But they will buy into relationship and sharing life together changed and transformed by God. Not, not divorced from the mission of Jesus and the gospel and the doctrines and, and the whole purpose of, the, of, of God's desire to transform us and not just leave us where we are. He loves us too much to leave us where we are. He's designed us for something way more. That's your mission. So what happens at the table? Jesus hosts a wonderful meal where he shares his love and his life with us. But you know what? And so I want you to commit to those four things. Write them down, think about them, pray about them, but they will marry this church to the mission of Jesus through Mesa Church in this next season and create a stronger, even stronger foundation for God to build upon. This is what I've realized. Every meal requires two things. You ready? People and money. So I want you to also commit to giving generously and inviting people generously. Can you imagine showing up to, you, you're so, you've anticipated it all year long. You buy a plane ticket and you fly all the way to your parents' house and they decided last minute to go spend Thanksgiving at some other sibling's house or something. This is not, just you know, my mom and dad are here, so don't <laughs> think that this, this is not an autobiography or whatever. And you show up, there's nobody at the house. There's no people to share this amazing meal with, and there's no meal. My goodness, that would be sad. So every meal requires two things, people and money. So give generously in this next season and invite people generously because what we have is beautiful. Now I want you to think through those four things one more time, not for you, but for someone else. Do you know anyone who needs to know God? Do you know anyone who needs to find freedom? Do you know anyone who needs to discover their purpose? Do you know anyone who would really love to make a difference in this world, but has no place to do it? William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury, said the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not yet its members. Mission exists because worship doesn't. Jesus is still the host of this dinner. I want to invite you to stand up. The beautiful thing about the mission of Jesus is his mission remains in Orange County, California. It remains in Dayton, Ohio. It remains in Indonesia. It remains in every country and city that the circuit riders are being sent to in this season. We're all a part of this together. This is where all the churches link arms for the mission of Jesus to be accomplished. And no single church can do that by itself. The body of Jesus is so much bigger than Mesa Church. It's so much bigger than the local collected gatherings of Jesus followers that exist here in Orange County. It is nationwide and it is global. That's why Jesus said, make disciples in every nation. I want you to bow your heads with me. And I want you to pray this with me. I'm not giving you a choice. I'm just asking you to do it. Lord, we want to be intentional about your mission here on earth and your last words for us to carry your mission 
to commission us into your mission field in our backyard, in our neighborhoods, and to the nations. Lord, we partner with missionaries financially and spiritually to see that this mission is not confined to the four walls of our church. And so I want to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer genuinely and authentically, I'm going to ask you to do something that maybe you've never done before. You know, if you were on a train and someone with a gun came up to you and they stuck that barrel into your side and they said, give me all your money, what would you do instinctively? (laughs) Well, Jesus isn't coercing you. But I love that image of surrender. And frankly, I think that's part of the reason why we lift our hands. I give up. I'll do what you want me to do. I'm out of ideas. This isn't my mission, it's your mission. This isn't my kingdom, it's your kingdom. These aren't my resources, they're your resources. We talked about being led by the Spirit. This is what it being, being led by the Spirit means. Lord, where are you calling us? Mesa, God called us from one place to another place, but His mission is still the same, and He's calling you to be an active part of His mission through this church. I've given you four practical ways to do that today, but ultimately it comes down to your willingness, and your willingness is connected to your heart. So let's take some time with Jesus, worshiping Him, and offering whatever it is that we have that He can use so that others might come to a saving relationship with Him. So that they can experience what we will experience forever.